everybody and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a review and a demonstration on the Winsor & Newton Professional watercolors, the tubes, the pans, and the metal um, tin palette box here. So not to be confused with the student grade line that Winsor & Newton offers, the Cotman watercolors, that's a different video. This is the professional line of watercolors. And I also have a demonstration, like I mentioned, on this flower, but I, I'm going to bring it in, but it's already in an archival safe bag, and so it's likely going to be a lot of glare, but I'll insert a photo, of course. So just a quick rundown before we get started of what you can expect in this video. I'm going to be talking about the tubes and the pans. I'm going to do some swatches. Um, we're going to talk about the different sets that they have to offer, the prices. We're going to do some comparisons to some other brands. Um, particularly the Daniel Smith watercolors. So let's go ahead and get started. So like I said, I do have quite a few of the tubes as well as the pans. I have a lot of experience with Winsor & Newton watercolors because they were the first brand that I had ever started with. And I think most watercolorists um, have used Winsor & Newton watercolors. Winsor & Newton is a art company that makes a lot of different kinds of art materials, including some very fine oil paints, some acrylics, canvases. I think they even do watercolor paper now, but they're most well known for their watercolor, which has been around since 1835. So more than 180 years those watercolors have been around. So from the website, I'm gonna read a little bit of information here for you guys. It says that um, through strict adherence to fa um, these founding principles, Windsor & Newton professional watercolors offer brilliance, transparency, and purity of color unparalleled by any other brand. Mm, we'll see about that. So what you can choose from from their watercolor brands is they have tube sets and individual tubes. They come in the five milliliter tubes as well as the 14 milliliter tubes. Each of the tubes do have all of the information on them um, about the series, pigment information, and whether or not it's a transparent or semi-transparent color. So I do appreciate that. One thing to take note of, however, is that unlike other brands, like Daniel Smith and M. Graham, for example, they're offering you 15 milliliter tubes, which is the standard, but Winsor & Newton gives you 14 milliliters, so they're cheating you a milliliter, even though the smaller tubes of like Daniel Smith, for example, are they're also five milliliters, um, so like the five milliliter tubes of Winsor & Newton are comparable to the Daniel Smith five milliliter tubes, but then the larger sizes are only 14 milliliters so that's kind of strange but so you're paying more and you're getting less paint is what I'm trying to tell you with that um, they range in price depending on what series and what size you get you can get a smaller um, five milliliter tube for as little as seven dollars and the larger 14 milliliter tubes could go up to as much as thirty dollars for this small tube however if you work in watercolor you do know that a little goes a long way and it is a relatively economical medium so something to keep in mind same thing with the pans they're a little bit more affordable typically the pans are going to run you anywhere from 10 to 15 dollars um, and, and that again depends on where you go I did want to talk about this metal box for a moment this is their 24 pan set their metal tin is really nice quality I have to give them credit on that so um, I only have 14 half pans in here right now I didn't put all of the you know squirt all the tubes into pans but Let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten of them are the pan watercolors, not tubes that were squeezed into pans and allowed to dry. And I'll talk a little bit about the differences a little bit later in this video. One thing that's a little bit unusual about theirs is that it's kind of got like this violet colored base. Um, 
but it doesn't stain very much, which I found to be extremely pleasant. And if it does have any areas of staining with like a phthalo color, you could just use a white vinyl eraser. And most of the time, if you just rub with a white vinyl eraser very gently, you can get any stains off your watercolor palette very, very easily. So I did like that. It is finished all the way around. If you saw one of my other videos on this channel where I updated my Daniel Smith palette, I was using the Schmincke half pan metal box and it's like razor sharp all the way around the edge. Not this one. It's much safer, much, much smoother, and I haven't noticed any rust and I've had this for a few years now. I got this as part of a set of 12 colors and they give you an idea of what colors you're going to get. Here's one of my biggest gripes with Winsor & Newton's sets, and I really feel the need to talk about this in this video. So my set was supposed to include 10, uh, 12 specific colors, but then it says actual contents may vary. So what I ended up getting in my set that I ended up having to give the boot to and I didn't appreciate was they gave me Genuine Alizarin Crimson, which is a fugitive color and no professional artist is using that anymore. And they also ended up giving me both Yellow Ochre and Raw Sienna, which is fine, but they're so ridiculously close that you definitely wouldn't need both. And I think they gave me an Ivory White um, and then the Ivory Black, of course, which I don't use black uh, at all. Most watercolors don't use white and black, so I'm tired of paying for white and black. But what I don't like about that is that it's basically like, hey, you know what? Order this set and you'll get what we give you. I don't appreciate that at all. I felt very insulted and I feel like they can do better to be more consistent. When you order a set from Daniel Smith, for example, or even M. Graham, whatever, any other brand, if you order the Daniel Smith Essential set, the colors that it tells you you're getting that's what you're getting. You're go they're going to give you a very clear list of contents in what you're getting, right? Winsor & Newton can do better. They absolutely can. They've been around for 180 years and you're telling me that they, they can't get, get it together? So I really didn't appreciate that. If you're a professional artist or even if you're just, uh, you know, a very serious, dedicated artist, you likely know what colors you want. So if you see a set that includes many of the colors that you traditionally use, you'd be more inclined to buy that set. And that's what happened to me. But when it got home, I had to throw out um, the original Lizard and Crimson it came with because I won't paint with that. It came with a white that I ended up throwing out. The Raw Sienna I saved, but I replaced with um, Quinacridone Gold, so I replaced it with my own tube paint. And I'm never going to use this black. So if they average around 10 to $12 a pan, let's say being on the lower side, then you just threw out the equivalent of 30 to $40 worth of paint or more, depending on how many of them you can or cannot use. So I feel like it's not really false advertising because they're telling you that contents may vary, but this is an issue to keep in mind with Winsor & Newton. If, it, if you know what colors you like and what you're gonna use, and most of the time artists are very serious about what colors they like and they're going to use, uh, then you may be very sadly disappointed. So I did want to absolutely mention that. All right, so at this point of the video, I want to go ahead and talk about the swatches. I swatched all of these out, and um, some of them are tubes, some of them are pans, about 50-50, and I want to talk a little bit about the difference. Now, of course, they offer both pans and tubes. A lot of people wonder, um, can you squirt the tubes into your palette or into a half pan, let it dry and work from that? Yes, absolutely that you can. The only difference that I would like to mention is that some of the colors are going to have a harder time rewetting than others. That's because Winsor & Newton, in my opinion, doesn't use enough glycerin or rewetting agent in their watercolors, and I think that's because they want to sell their half pans. But in general, most of the colors, I don't notice any difference in how they re-wet and reactivate between tubes that I've squirted in and let dry and the half pans. In fact, some of the half pans that I have, um, they have a little bit harder of a time releasing color than the tubes actually. So they need to be sprayed with water and let to sit for five to 10 minutes before I begin painting. 
but you're not going to have any problems. I recommend the tubes most of the time unless you're buying a set that comes with half pans like I did. Um, and one thing that you can do, most of the colors I found really didn't need it, like the quinacridone colors um, and the phthalo colors did fine uh, without needing anything added, but you can add some glycerin or some honey into the paint. Just add a drop or just a drop into a half pan is fine. Stir it with a toothpick, incorporate it in there really well, and that will help it to release a little bit better. That is definitely what I did with the ultramarine violet. You can see I used up most of this tube already. And I added just a drop of honey um, so that it would re-wet better because otherwise, it dried into a hard rock and I really wasn't able to get the paint out. The only colors that I've noticed that issue with for sure are the, the ultramarines and the viridian, forget about it. You definitely need to add something into that paint or buy the half pan. That's fine. So I wanted to go over the colors here and then give the benefit of my opinion. Um, so the lemon yellow, this is a nickel pigment. This is not a color that I would traditionally choose for myself. It came with the set. I would normally prefer a brighter, cleaner, more transparent cool yellow like Azo or Hansa Yellow Light. It is all absolutely light fast, which is nice, but um, it's very opaque. It's the most opaque color that I have here. A little bit chalky, to be honest, in heavy applications and kind of dirty. It's not as visually eye clean. But I did find it to be very soft and kind of buttery in lighter applications. Like I did use this for the flower demonstration that will be coming up next. And I did enjoy it for that painting. But in general, it's not a favorite of mine. I won't be repurchasing it. The Windsor Yellow is a nice warm Hansa Yellow, um, leaning more neutral. It is very transparent, very visually eye clean, lovely strong saturated color. Windsor Red, it's just a pyrrole red. They like to put the name Windsor in front of things like the yellow, the red, the violet, the blue, and probably a ton of other colors. But that pyrrole red is executed very, very, very nicely. And uh, I definitely approve of that color. It's mostly transparent. I would call it borderlining on semi-transparent, but most of the time you're not gonna use it at full mass strength there. Um, and it will be transparent for you. The Permanent Rose. Their Permanent Rose is one of my favorite. And um, it is very, very transparent, very, very lovely color. It's my second favorite. Um, the M Gram is my absolute favorite, but I do still repurchase this from time to time because it's a beautiful color. The Quinacridone Magenta, I used up this entire tube and then ended up picking up the large tube. You saw this in a haul video. Their Quinacridone Magenta is the best color from the whole line in my opinion, and it is my favorite Windsor Newton color, and I will always repurchase it because it's the most clean and vibrant saturated magenta of any brand that they have to offer. M. Graham doesn't offer anything like this, and uh, of course, Daniel Smith has probably a billion magentas, let's be honest. Their color range is huge, but um, I thought theirs was a little bit undersaturated compared to this one, so it is my favorite. The Ultramarine Violet, like I said, if you're going to get this in the tube form, add a little honey, otherwise you're going to have some problems with it. This is a favorite amongst floral painters. I do love the granulation, and it's one of the stronger Ultramarine Violets, to be very honest. I do like that one a lot. The Windsor Violet, there is their Dioxazin Violet pigment, almost black in mass tone. It is very strong, very transparent, solid color. Their Windsor Blue or Thalo Blue, you can't mess that up. Their Aqua Green, this they're calling this a new color, but this was released as part of the Twilight Silhouette, maybe it was, like a limited edition color. It is a single pigment, and it falls somewhere between phthalo blue and phthalo green, a little bit more toward the green than a traditional turquoise. I actually considered putting this on my main palette. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that or not, but I really, really do love this color. It is very, very pretty. Their Ultramarine Blue, it's their French version that I have here, so you're going to pay a little bit more for that. It's going to be a premium. It is a nice, strong color. Doesn't granulate as much as the Daniel Smith. Um, 
I, th I think it's okay. It's it's ultramarine blue. It's not bad, but it's not my favorite either. I prefer the Windsor, um, the uh, M. Graham, excuse me. Sap Green, I use this one in my painting as well. And I have to mention that it's a mixture of their Quin Gold and their Thalo Green. It is very, very vibrant and a little bit too high chroma to be believable as a sap green or as a natural green. Um, it's a little too vibrant, so it's just... In, it's not my favorite sap green. I definitely prefer Daniel Smith's, um, and we'll do some comparisons in a moment. Their yellow ochre, nothing really wrong with it, to be honest. Um, it's yellow ochre, so, and it's definitely, it's still more transparent than their lemon, so that should give you an idea just how opaque, because yellow ochre is traditionally an opaque pigment, so that lemon is kind of chalky, definitely, if you're going to use it at full strength. Quinacridone Gold. They're calling this Quinacridone Gold, but uh, just to let you guys know, this is a hue color, absolutely, which means they're using other pigments to replicate the hue or replicate that color. There is no pure Quin Gold pigment in there, as where Daniel Smith is still using their Quin Gold, and M. Graham is using Nickel Quinacridone Gold, so it is Quin Gold plus their Nickel Azo Yellow. I wish that they would call this a hue or maybe rename it because that is a little bit misleading. Their Burnt Sienna, I have this both in half pan and in tube form. This is the half pan you're seeing here. Um, they compare, you know, they perform very similarly, but uh, I don't like their Burnt Sienna, I have to be honest. I know it's a favorite amongst some watercolor artists. It depends on the style that you like to paint in. They're using PR 101, which is not burnt sienna at all, but rather transparent red iron oxide, which I like that color in other brands, but theirs is very weak. It is very, very weak. And to be honest, I wouldn't waste your money on it. I would much rather steer you toward the um, M. Graham version of this color, and I'm gonna do some comparisons um, in a minute, but this color's not worth your money, I'm sorry. It's just the truth, I have to be honest with myself and with you guys, I don't think this is worth your money, unless you really like to work in very, very pale hues. And then the ivory black, I don't have an opinion about the black, to be very honest, because I don't use black paint. It's one of those colors that came in this set that I didn't want and didn't wanna pay for, but here we are anyway. Um, I guess there's nothing wrong with it, but I have no opinion about it because I don't use black watercolor. So I wanted to first show you in comparison directly, these are the Daniel Smith watercolors here. And um, as you can see, uh, comparatively, I mean, these are just so vibrant and beautiful. Same paper and everything. I just wanted to show you just you know, side by side some comparisons. So I'd compare the Windsor Yellow to the Hunza Yellow Medium. Um, definitely Daniel Smith wins out on that one. Um, Pyrol to Pyrol there. Quin Rose to Permanent Rose. You can see the vibrancy there. The Doxes and Violets are very comparable. Or actually Daniel Smith calls theirs Carbazole Violet, whatever. Um, I definitely prefer the French Ultramarine from uh, Daniel Smith and their Sap Green there. So what I have here is I have a sheet of comparisons and I pulled this out. If this looks familiar, I pulled this out in my Daniel Smith review video as well. Um, but I'm just going to be showing you the ones that are relevant. I'm going to be pointing out the differences. So this is Windsor Yellow to the Hansa Yellow here. Um, very comparable, but I think Daniel Smith is stronger. Windsor Red, which is a Pyrol Red to the Pyrol Scarlet by um, Daniel Smith. Very similar. French Ultramarine here, you can see the differences. Um, M. Graham's my favorite. It just wins. It just does. Um, the sap green, you can see that Windsor Newton is the most unnatural of the three that I have here. I think Daniel Smith is probably the most beautiful, but because it's a little bit more toward the yellow, it has a tendency to go a little bit um, less than fresh if you're not careful with that. You cannot mess up Thalo Blue slash Windsor Blue. I mean, it just, it is what it is. 
the permanent rose. I, I really do like Winsor & Newton's permanent rose. I think that it is very beautiful. M. Graham is my favorite. And I do like the Daniel Smith, but I have to say it's, it's just a little bit cooler. A little bit more toward the magenta. What else do I have here? Oh, yes. I wanted to talk about the uh, yellow ochre and the burnt sienna. So here you have uh, Winsor & Newton's yellow ochre in the middle. Daniel Smith is the most transparent. M. Graham's is the most yellow. Burnt Sienna, that Windsor Newton, I mean look how dull and puny and wimpy that is. I just have to be very honest, I don't like that color from the brand. I think that it uh, it kind of diminishes the brand as a whole to be very honest. They need to put more pigment in that. For a professional paint, I think that's, you're really wasting your money on that. And here is M. Graham's PR 101, which is exactly the same pigment next door here. And look how much more pigment you're getting. So it depends on how you like to work. Um, it really depends on you and what style you are as a watercolorist. A more traditional watercolorist who likes to work in lighter, paler hues, um, and especially lighter floral paints, you might find that you prefer Windsor & Newton because it's it might be easy for you to get carried away with other brands that might be stronger. So it might be easier for you to control the Windsor & Newton paint, but in general, uh, I think they're a little bit hit and miss. I, a lot of the colors are very strong and saturated. They're all very transparent with the exception of that lemon. They glaze really, really well. That's a huge pro to this brand. They glaze very, very well. And I'm a little bit torn about this review because Winsor & Newton is a very well-established brand and I know that they have a cult following and are very, very well beloved. But for an artist like myself, if you want your watercolors to almost have that oil paint look to them in terms of very saturated, rich darks, you might not get that with this brand. I found it very difficult as I was going through with the, the painting demonstration that I'll be showing you in a moment. I found it very hard to get rich, saturated darks. And even as I started to push toward that direction, I noticed that it seemed to build up on the paper in a, almost a gelatinous way. And that lets me know that there's more filler in these paints than there is pigment in some of the colors. I'm thinking the Burnt Sienna, for example, um, and even that sap green, at least in the pan form. And I was using Arches 100% cotton cold press watercolor paper. And just to show you an example of some of my work that I've done on that paper, I'm going to insert a photo of the roses, which I also have a video on a, ro a bloom of roses past, present, and future. I did that on this channel a little bit earlier in the year. So I will link that up if you'd like, if you're interested in watching that. But with that painting I was using Daniel Smith and M. Graham watercolors and I was able to get very saturated darks and I was able to glaze a lot pretty much indefinitely. I was able to get more layers with other paint instead of this brand because I feel like there's a little bit more filler in these paints and that kind of limits the glazing. Um, so I did want to be very, very honest with this video. However, they mix very, very clean. If you take um, you know, any of your primary colors and mix them, you will get very saturated, very vibrant secondary colors. Um, and I found that no matter how much I mixed, I wasn't getting mud. So even when I mix some of the permanent rose into the sap green, of course they'll neutralize each other out, but I did mix some of that in there to dull the green some, and I found that I still got a, a very lively result. It was difficult to mix mud because the pigments are very saturated and very, very vibrant. So I thought I'd give a recap of my overall thoughts on these paints while we play the demo and go over the pros and cons list. While working through this painting, the biggest thing that frustrated me is I found it difficult to achieve deep, saturated darks. There just wasn't enough pigment in some of these colors to get there. I wanted rich, jewel-like glazes, but found everything came out a bit undersaturated and slightly washed out or pale even looking. They are very transparent on the bright side, and that made them great glazing colors, all but that lemon yellow, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. 
I just didn't think I could get as many layers with these um, as I could with other brands of paints because they felt a little bit gelatinous. Some of the colors, particularly that burnt sienna, they just felt like they had a little bit more filler in them than what I'm accustomed to for a pro brand paint. So let's talk about that yellow, that lemon yellow. It is very, very chalky and opaque in mass tone. Diluted heavily, it was usable, and I found it worked to achieve a very soft, buttery, creamy yellow uh, that worked really well for this piece, and I, I do like how it came out. However, overall, it's a very low timber powered in mixes, which became a struggle. When I would try and mix it with the sap green to achieve a lighter, cooler green for some areas, it took a lot of that yellow and very little of the sap green. I had also mixed it some with the magenta to get more of like a peachy, corally, orangey color in some places, and it worked, but again, it was overpowered extremely quickly. The rest of the colors performed very well though, with little complaints, with the exception of that um, yellow and the burnt sienna, which I've already talked about at lengths here. But all the way across the board, they do seem light on pigment, especially compared to other brands like Daniel Smith and M. Graham, which might make them easier to control. So that might be seen as an advantage depending on how you look at it and depending on your style and how you like to work. I can see how some people may feel overwhelmed by pigment with a brand like M. Graham and feel like they easily get too much and become overpowered. Uh, so again, it can be seen as an advantage or a disadvantage depending on how you look at it. But some felt more gelatinous, almost like student grade paint, particularly I'm thinking that burnt sienna which lets me know that there is more filler in these paints than the other brands, the other pro paint brands that I have. So am I happy with how this painting came out? Yes, I actually really very much am. I titled this painting The Sleeping Bud and I really do like the colors. I was trying to achieve um, a fresh morning glow to this piece. I wanted it to look bathed in that cool bluish morning light ready to just burst into bloom, and I really do feel like it came out nice, and I'm happy with the work overall, but I find the paint to be just okay. In general, do I recommend this paint? Yes, but depending on where you live and what your availability may be, uh, I, knew, I do understand that in some countries, if you're across the water in the UK, maybe this is the only pro paint you have available. It's not bad paint. I find them to be rather mediocre to be very honest not great but not terrible but for your money there are better paint brands out there like daniel smith and m graham there used to be a time where winsor newton was the only game in town when it came to really good watercolors but that's not the case anymore and i feel like they underperform for the price point sort of a mediocre brand paint kind of hidden by a good name coasting on that winsor newton reputation would be my honest honest thoughts and so I really do feel like they have to step up their game a little bit and do a little bit better because there's stiff competition out there so a quick pros and cons list and a recap on the pros list availability would be one of the biggest pros I know that in some places this is the only paint you have available to you and it is easy to walk into a big box store like Michaels AC Moore even Hobby Lobby often has the Winsor & Newton paints, and you can go in there with a coupon and get a pretty good deal. Do not pay full price for these, though. Use a half-off coupon where possible. They're also extremely transparent, most of them, again, with the exception of, like, the yellow, for example. They are bright, clear, saturated pigments, and they don't mix mud very easily, so they are nice quality pigments. They flow very nice wet into wet and they bloom beautifully. So there's a nice consistent flow and bloom with them. They handle well. On the cons list, I would say the price. They seem a little bit overpriced. They are hit and miss in color strength. So some of them are more pigmented than others. Some feel more gelatinous, more like student grade paint. The sets are inconsistent with the colors listed, so they give you some idea of what colors you might get, but why even bother? Why even bother giving that list of colors that you might get in the set? Because 
you might get completely different colors. It's kind of like you get what we send you and I don't appreciate that. To be very honest, I feel insulted by that as an artist. The other con is that they are 14 milliliter tubes, the large tubes, not the standard 15 milliliters. So they're more expensive and you get less. And the last con is that both the pans and the tubes can have a hard time releasing the paint, especially if you need, especially with those pans. If you need to mix a lot of paint, a large puddle of paint, uh, it might take you some time to work them out. So a little bit of tip I want to give there is spray the paint pans 10 minutes before you start painting. Saturate them with water, soak them a little bit, and that will make it a little bit more easily, uh, easy for the paint to release a little bit better. And that is my review for today. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you found this helpful. If you did, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos coming in the future. Uh, I feel a little bit torn about this review because I know that this is a big brand with a cult following, but I've got to give my honest feedback here and I feel good about what I've said here today. So thank you so much for watching again. And as always, have a great day.